Coming up on Star Talk, we feature my interview with the CEO and co-founder of Rocket Pharma. This is a company in New Jersey that specializes in finding cures for genetic ailments using gene therapy. More on that coming up. Welcome, Neil and Chuck. Thank you. I don't know if we would have done this if the name of your company didn't have the word rocket in it. I know. <laughs> I know. So, I asked you. so if I. Yeah, you know, uh, before this, we got duped into doing something for Rocket Mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> it's RKT, not RCKT. Okay, okay yes, got it. Right. Oh, different, 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 different ticker. Different ticker. ticker. Yeah, exactly. Um, the, the, the fact that you had a telescope as a kid, and the, so you have you have a science geek underbelly within you, astro science geek underbelly. So. Did you, would you have rather have been an astrophysicist? Like, did you just stumble into this field? Yeah, what are you, what are you doing wasting your life on this crap? <laughs> <It's right. laughs> Saving lives. Saving lives <laughs> curing disease. Yeah, yeah you I, could have been completely yeah. useless like the rest of us. What's the... You know, I, I grew up in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. And, Fort Worth? Um, yeah, there's a lot of spelling bee nerds that come out of there for some reason. Is that they right? all go to... They, I think most winners come from Fort Worth. It's like this really weird thing. But uh, the son of Indian immigrants who came from India and wanted the best for us, um, you only have three career choices, really. It's medicine, engineering, and I'm not sure what the third one is. There's a, right? right? So, um, and uh, so, but I also, you know, it was a science theme that pervaded the first several years of my life, whether it was astronomy or medicine, and I, I loved both. Um, actually, in my first year of college, though, I was an astronomy major under John Huckstra. Oh, yes. Years yeah, ago, uh, but Hooker. it changed. John Hooker. Hooker, Hooker yes. Yeah, yeah. That's at Harvard. Yeah. And, that's uh, a way to say he's saying he went to Harvard. I was trying. So <laughs> that's how that, you do that, you know? If, okay. I was trying not, to Not to be supply. confused with the John Hooker of Rutgers. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, um, yeah. I was trying to be quiet about it. Yeah, yeah. You, John you and me. Was a friend and yeah. colleague. Yes. No, so, so I, I'm delighted to learn that, that the universe was part of what excited you to be a scientist, to go into science fields. And then there's this thing about a Grammy. So you, you're also a musician. And what I'd like to know, just to start off before we get into the nitty gritty here, would you say your career in music, your side career in music, mattered or contributed to your inspirations or curiosity in the sciences? I think they're all sort of the same. Is what I would say. I think the uh, whether well, to your mother when you come home saying you would be a musician. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I did, and it didn't work out. Yeah, so well. but it didn't work out so that well. That conversation didn't go yeah. very no, well. No, it did not. I right. ended up marrying a musician, and that's you know that's one step removed. But okay. uh, you know, okay. so it worked out. Um, but I think they're all the same. I think that uh, whether it's music, or astronomy, or medicine, there's a sense of feeling connected to other people feeling connected to something greater, uh, for making sure that we don't feel alone in the universe. I think that's the connection between these, these disciplines. Interesting. So if not to put words in your mouth, but you're suggesting, I think correctly and accurately, that art is a force of nature unto itself that serves to bring humans together. Mm. Not only the artists themselves, but those who might not have such talent, but the, they are nonetheless touched by the art. Absolutely. Actually, when we're in a band and we're performing, it doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what language you speak. Uh, it doesn't matter how old you are. Um, it, it real, everyone becomes a fellow musician. A you're, participant you're, you're, in the experience. And you're seeking something that's bigger than the band. But it does matter which one of you has a fallback in science. <laughs> So, so that you will not be sleeping on your friend's couch right, right. at age 45. Right, right. <laughs> and which is why there are street musicians, but there aren't street scientists. Right. Just, <laughs> you just you think go. that through. Exactly. Just, just right. I'll calculate for a dollar. <laughs> <That's it>. <laughs> <laughs> so would you say, given this, this beautiful reference to humanity and our, the connectivity within us, uh, would you say you approach 
your science with an artistic lens or do you approach your art with a science lens? It's both. Great. I, I love so the question. It's a two-way lens. In real, I don't think these are that separable mm -hmm. uh, in my view. And I'll give you specific examples. In gene therapy, the way that gene therapy works is that there's a viral vector and a transgene that carries the, the corrected DNA to the patient's cells, right? And in figuring out how to create that vector, you can create a million types of vector and only one will be the best one. And how do you know? We can predict, you can use AI, you can use mathematics, various models to figure out that you need the right promoter, the right length, cut out the stuff that doesn't matter. At the end of the day, there's an art to it. There's a music to it. And what's actually gonna work is what the intersection of that vector and the patient and that patient's body, which is a musical artistic thing, less scientific. In the same way, when one is learning music, you have to be rigorous, rational, rational um, practice over and over again, and really, really think. It's a cerebral thing to really learn music until you get to a point where it's natural and it's distinctive. So I don't think there's that much of a difference. All right. Mm. Now, now, you mentioned gene therapy. I, could you, let's do gene therapy 101 for the moment. For, it's for me, and yeah. I, I don't know, maybe Chuck knows. Well, I already know what gene therapy is. <laughs> <laughs> it's for other people. Yeah, right? I mean, you know, it's like maybe the people out there who work for the company might want to know. <laughs> you know, I mean, you have some genes, they lay on the couch, you know. <laughs> they talk about their gene mother. <laughs> right. So, so, you know, we, many of us have heard of gene editing, and so maybe let me start with the question, can you distinguish for us, for me, between gene editing and gene therapy? Absolutely, and I know you've done a podcast with Jennifer Doudna. Yes, uh, we did, yeah. Who, yeah. yeah. Which I saw, which was really fabulous and, and uh, much to learn from. Um, so think of your whole genome like a book. And what gene editing does is it finds a word that was misspelled, wipes it out, and writes in the correct word, right? Each page is a gene. So you edit, that's called gene editing. What you said we whites do. it out? Yeah, like white out. Whites it out. White out. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I grew up in, <laughs> I, I okay, grew for up everyone in, younger than 30 in right. this room, there used to be a typewriter <laughs> and paper and ink. I know, right. <laughs> okay. And then there was this liquid. Mm -hmm. Okay. They so. still have it in Texas, they, by the way. Yes, for sure. Um, okay, so you would you would uh, yeah, so you blot it out. Blot it out and you write or type in the correct word. And what we do, uh, traditional gene therapy, is you add the whole page with the corrected word in it. You just add the whole gene back instead of trying to edit it individually with individual letters. Oh. Word. So that's the difference. Is it, why, what, isn't that harder to put all the genes back than just fix one of them? We can uh, create the gene um, in, in a lab, basically with the whole sequence intact, and you don't have to edit. It's the scissors and editing part that's hard, oh, right. right? Just replacing the whole thing is actually really much easier. And That I didn't know. Right, right. And, and, and gene editing is, is starting to work. Uh, there's a company that just released a product in sickle cell disease just a, a week ago. So it is starting to work, but traditional gene therapy is here for so many patients who need it now. There's, uh, ways to replace genes that will work for cardiac and hematology diseases um, and reach these patients who are otherwise going to probably die pretty soon without waiting for gene editing. So if you do this, if you swap that out, again, I'm still in gene 101 here. Every one of my cells has my entire genome in it, correct? Mm. Yeah. Okay, so what does it mean to swap it out here when I have all the rest of my body cells? Are you going into every one of my body cells to do this? So there's something called tropism, uh, the, the attraction for the viral Trump vector. Trumpism? Trumpism. Mm -hmm. What did he say? He said, I'm a gene. <laughs> I'm just a gene. Very good gene. Very good. The best. The best gene. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so the tropism. Trump Tropism. Tropism is the attraction of a vector, and I'll come back to a vector. You're loving yourself for, for vectors here. Yeah, I love vectors, okay. yeah. Uh, for a particular cell type. For example, 
there's a, a vector called AAV, AAV9 specifically, that loves the heart. And it's tropic for the heart. So it primarily will take the corrected gene to the heart, not to all the cells in the body. That, that's essentially how it works. Oh, so, so, so now when, you, when you do this, let's, do you, does there have to be a problem? Or can you identify the potential of a problem, change the page, and then once you do that, will I then pass that corrected gene on to my offspring? That was my next question. Yeah, so right now... Wow, we've been working together too long, man. <laughs> no, so uh, gene therapy right now, gene therapy and gene editing is directed towards somatic cells. So only cells that are already fully developed, not germline cells. There may be a day when you want, when we want to correct our disease and also make sure that our offspring don't have it. But the first step is to correct the individual's disease. That's what we're focused on right now and probably for the foreseeable future. It seems to me if you're really good at that, then you don't have to correct it at the germ level because you just do it any, at any time it comes up, you just right. do it. Yeah. You, just, yeah. you go to the hospital and you go home and then you're done. That's right. And Chuck, you also asked the question, do you do it after there's disease or before? Right. So, with our trials, we have to start in a setting where the disease is already present, right? Someone, are, for example, we have a drug in a certain form of devastating heart failure called Dannon disease. We want to wait right now until patients actually manifest Dannon disease because you don't want to treat somebody unnecessarily while still being tested. Is there somebody named Dannon? There is a Dr. Dannon who also came to a, a seminar just like this a couple right. of years and ago. And it's his disease? That's what I'm saying. He That's discovered it. Let, let me tell you he some advice this. here, okay? Well, I was once got a phone call and said, we'd like to name an asteroid after you. After you. And I, my next question was, is it headed towards Earth? <laughs> <laughs> you don't want asteroid Tyson to take out <laughs> civilization. So they said, oh no, it's safe in the asteroid belt. Yeah. So I said, thank you. So, so, so to have a disease that is especially lethal with your name on it doesn't sound like an honor. Unless Dr. Tyson was gonna also help steer the asteroid away from Earth. Right. Which is what Dr. Yeah. Dannon did. Oh. Uh, that he that also sounds like the uh, volunteer firefighter the who started the fire. Oh! <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, no, so do, uh, Dr. Dannon's a wonderful person. He, he discovered the disease, but he also helped us uncover the, the solution for it. Okay. So, so now, you, you have, um, you're using viruses for this because they're kind of badass at what they do, yeah, right? Exactly. And so you, you're, you're recognizing this fact. So how do you know which virus to use of the countless ones that we share this planet? Mm. Yeah, that, that's been a journey of probably three decades of earlier discovery before we, we got to this place. Uh, we use two types of viruses. One is a lentivirus, which is a modified HIV virus. We know how infectious HIV can be, but we're inactivating it and making sure that it doesn't self-replicate, but still that's infects good cells. Yeah. Okay. Right? So still infects cells. Um, and that's good for bone marrow diseases, hematology conditions. Sickle cell is actually one of them, uh, a hematology disease where something like lentivirus would be good. And another virus we use is called AAV, uh, adeno-associated virus. And AAV is non-infectious, but also can infect cells uh, pretty robustly. And we use that for our cardiac diseases, as well as other companies have worked on CNS, and liver and other diseases using AAV. So you select the virus based on the target organ, again, where it would be most tropic for. So you're turning, <laughs> reminds me of a quote from Abraham Lincoln, and he said, nice. can we not defeat our enemies by making them our friends? For enemies? Well, yeah. no, no, that's different. No, no, yeah, no, that, no. that was real housewives. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, the point is, you have viruses, and none of us thinks nice things about viruses. Right. You right. turn them into something that can help us, and then viruses become our friends. Actually, for folks who are right now uh, potentially cured of their hematologic diseases like Fanconi anemia and, and LED, which we're working on, those viruses are their friends. Hey, everybody. I just finished my tier list video of my favorite and least favorite films. Check it out on our newly launched Star Talk YouTube channel called Star Talk Plus. So you, you've said vector at least 30 times in this conversation. Yeah. So you have a, you have a, a virus that, and, and my, I have a cartoon understanding of viruses. There's a cell, there's a virus, and 
they'll only interact if there's a way for them to physically connect. Right. And so can a virus otherwise just bust in to do its work? Or does it need some kind of back door or some kind of trap door that it knows about? A docking station. Docking station? How, how does that work? I'm glad you say that. So yes, there are protein-protein interactions on the surface of the virus and the surface of the cell. And that's exactly what tropism is. But taking uh, maybe the cartoon. Oh, so you're saying in tropism, it's not even biochemical, it's physical. Yes, yes. That's what you, protein, that's what you protein. mean by tropism. Correct. Oh, right. okay. Right. The shapes match up and then right. there you go. Exactly, exactly. Okay. But so it's like a dock, right? So think of a vector like a rocket. There comes the rocket. And, yeah. Thank and, you. Uh, and <laughs> You knew that was cut. You knew that was coming. Uh, uh, listen, I would have. I wouldn't have it any other. Way. <laughs> okay. You're not surprised. That's right. Right. No. Okay. Uh, the rocket. Uh, the vector is like a rocket. The gene that you're correcting is basically the cargo or the payload or even the people, right? And you're basically. Uh, you can use that analogy to think about gene therapy, right? Taking corrected gene into cells, just like a rocket takes people to wherever they want to go. Where Where do you want to go, by the way? I like Earth. You're fine, okay. Yeah. <laughs> You're fine. Okay, so a rocket has a, is vectored, right? It has a direction and it has a, a purpose and a mission and, a, and that's the velocity. Right. Okay. I, I was debating with some of my team about velocity as a value because we want to move fast, but they're like, well, rocket already has velocity, so it's sort of redundant. I said, fine. A velocity can equal zero, right? right just oh, to be clear. Wow. Yeah. Good point. V equals zero. Yeah. V that equals zero, false. right. Okay. That's right. Fine. And Fair. velocity can even be negative as a vector. Yeah. I stand down. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, all right. So here's a big economic question. If there's a rare disease out there, what is your, other than the goodwill you might have, what is your financial incentive to invest people, time, energy, resources, venture capital money to cure that where you can run the math on it and it could never pay your bills. No critical um, math. Unless you charge like right. $100 million per dose, right. which is just absurd. Right. And so, then you got to hope that Jeff Bezos is the one who has the disease. Just write that check right there. <laughs> yeah. so, so tell me, what is your relationship to this world of rare diseases, and how does that make economic sense? Yeah, so I think someone who pursues rare disease is a rare individual. It takes a certain uh, mission, passion-driven driven focus, science focus, um, and entrepreneurship to really go into rare disease. Um, bigger companies tend to shy away from rare disease because, to your point, it doesn't make business sense. But for a small company that's starting out, it makes total business sense. You were publicly traded, but you'd still be counted as a small company. I, in my mind, we're a startup because the mindset of a startup is that uh, everyone cares and there's, uh, we're all founders, we're all owners, and the patients and we are connected very personally. So even if we blossom into a much bigger company, we'll always be a startup in our mindset. Now, Keep telling yourself that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 283 people here. Yeah, when it, I think when we all feel that way. Um, 28,000 people. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Thing, but that is... Uh, okay, so a, a startup mentality, by the way, is one of the healthiest things that can exist in a growing economy because then ideas can germinate. They're not Flourish. squashed by legacy of whatever people think should be true. Versus Latitude to be creative. Yeah, all, all of that. Right. We're loving that. So, all right. I, I looked at some numbers before I got here. I did a little bit of homework. Uh -oh. And there's a website that is all about rare diseases. Um, what is it? The National uh, Nord. Nord. See, everybody here knows Nord. Right. Uh, and what I noticed is there are so many rare diseases that r the rare disease category is almost as big as any other diseases that are not rare. Mm. So in other words, rare diseases are not rare. As an aggregate. As in the right. aggregate, is that? Yeah, I, it's funny, I, it's funny you say that. Yeah, so each rare disease is rare, but rare disease is not rare. Yeah. It, right. It, right, another way to say it. And um, yeah, they're- As a category. As a category, so if, that's so exactly if bust, right. If you bust in and, and you're good at rare diseases, that is, and, and it's the tactic that you invoke which could have specificity depending on the disease, but the, the methods and tools are similar. Correct. Oh my gosh, you can corner the market on rare diseases. Yeah, so actually 
in. I shouldn't have said it that way. That's so ah. crass. No, no, it's great. <laughs> this is America. Corner of the market. We are totally fine with what you just said. No, no, we, no, know, no. we know exactly what she said. No, it's corner of the market is so uh, crass. But okay. The, the reality is that this developing these therapies does take a lot of money and requires investment, and it requires dedicated investors who are here long term. Also, the government has a program called Pediatric Review Voucher Program that will reward companies who just get an approval for a rare disease. Uh, you know, so it sort of helps offset some of those costs. So that there's a nice partnership there between industry and, and regulators. You, you would expect right. at some level the government to step in if something's not otherwise financial, if it cares about its own citizens. Correct. And, uh, so and are, there, um, are, are there residual or tertiary kind of benefits that come out of the specificity? When you, when you solve, it's very specific, can you then say, oh, all these other you know, areas are now uh, helped. Absolutely, so we uh, here at Rocket. What you're trying to say is, can one thing help other things? Is that what you just Basically, to say? yes. Okay. Yeah, can can exactly. one thing help okay. other things? Another way to say it is that we have a platform approach. So once you figure out one solution for a cardiac disease, it's easier to apply other therapies to other yeah, cardiac yeah. diseases. Okay. Right? Uh, we recognize that. So does the FDA, by the way. They're trying to make things easier for us through both clinical and manufacturing right. sort of streamlining. And, and, when, and when you discover that help in the other areas, do you get a cut of that as well? <laughs> well, if it's patented, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, we have some folks here who uh, know quite a bit about FTO, freedom to operate and patents, but I think that uh, the profitability here takes a long time oh. as a startup. Uh, some of the most successful companies are only profitable about eight years after their biggest launch. So. That's gonna take time, but uh, we're really here for the passion, the mission, and uh, ultimately, the money will follow the science. So right now, are you, are you tracking certain, do you have certain specialty diseases you're, you're targeting? What, what are they? So we have six diseases that we target. Three of them are bone marrow derived, which are Fanconi anemia, a disease of uh, DNA repair. The DNA, DNA actually can't repair itself. Carl Sagan and you uh, had an episode with this DNA repair mechanism. Right, so this is faulty in Fanconi anemia. Uh, I remember that from when I was eight and then again when I was a little bit older and watching your Cosmos. Uh, so Fanconi- You a pretty good graphic on that. You did, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's really right. Better than, should I say, better than the original, but that was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, 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 the original yeah. was 1980. Let's yeah. hope, let's hope. Yeah, yeah um, 44 years ago. Um, so I, just a, a quick yeah, point, yeah, yeah, I just have yeah. to slip this in there. Please. Um, what I did know about, I took biology as a senior in high school, yeah. which was ver inverted from what was typical at the time, I think even today. Yeah. Uh, I took physics first, then chemistry, then biology. So biology for me was more, I'll do it because I have to, right? Yeah. But there's some things I remembered that the DNA molecule is actually handed. So if you put a DNA molecule in a mirror, those are not the same molecules. So, because it, it turns the other way. And so one of the early versions, because the artists were the, the, the computer graphic folks were creating the DNA molecule, and it was spinning the wrong way. I said, no, that's not on this planet. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the DNA molecule spins sort of helically clockwise, if you're looking right. up from below, and it'll do that no matter how you orient it. Right. So uh, I'm just proud of myself for that. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> yeah. A little applause for that, I think, but thank you. Okay. <laughs> that's great. I'm that's my little... I, 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 I like chirality and handedness and things like that. Uh, but uh, back to the point. So you were, you were listing your diseases yeah, that you focus on. Yeah. yeah, so Fanconi anemia is actually exactly one of those molecules doesn't work in Fanconi anemia. One of those repair pathways doesn't work. So these patients develop bone marrow failure and leukemia in their teen, uh, single digit years in their teens. So we have a therapy in Fanconi anemia that uh, is going to be submitted to the FDA for approval first half of 2024. Um, just quickly, LAD1 is a disease of infectious disease that um, really kills little boys and girls by the age of two in two thirds of cases. So it redefines the word devastating. They're in and out of hospitals with fungal pneumonias. Uh, and we've now treated nine patients. All of them are out about two years or more. And instead of living till the age of two, they may turn 92. In fact, our treating doctor who works with us, and we didn't say this because we can't, uh, said this is a cure, right? At, at the DNA level, 
correcting the DNA is the most fundamental way that we can cure disease as, as human beings as, as we see it, right? right? Third one is called pyruvate kinase deficiency. Uh, it's like a hemolytic anemia, um, like a sickle cell or like a beta thalassemia. And then we have three cardiac programs that uh, our company is the first one to get into that space. Dannon disease, which I mentioned, uh, a disease of the heart where these boys, more than girls, but boys pass away in their teenage years as well of cardiomyopathy. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you hear about these athletes who suddenly fall over. Now we know why some of them fall over. They have something like Dannon disease or PKP2 is another arrhythmia or back three. So we're really uncovering the fact that a lot of what we call traditional disease like heart disease or even stroke or Alzheimer's is actually many diseases. Right. And we're trying to go after them one by one genetically. So, and, and you're targeting childhood diseases. Yeah. That, yes. That's the, the greatest loss of life is yeah. the death of a child is in the statistics of population. That's right. Yeah. right. That's terrible. I mean, that's right. you, you die at 80 because, of, okay, you lost 10 years tops. Yeah. And can any of these applications um, have relevance in uh, chronic lifestyle diseases, which is what we see most of in America? Yes, uh, there are some folks working on uh, preventing coronary artery disease through a similar gene pathway. Um, where people are working on Alzheimer's, uh, Huntington and Parkinson are already targets. So um, the way we see it is that we want to crack open the door based on single gene defects, right? Mm. Like the ones I, I mentioned, or like sickle cell. And that'll They're ultimately- They're at least tractable. Right? They're tractable, there's something yes. that has 32 genes going yeah. on, you're, you're, in, you're in a, you can't. Right, so we start with one, we'll get to two, eventually we'll be able to tackle many genes, but that's a ways away, uh, and I think we're just trying to get the, the well, how ways away is it if we have AI plus quantum computing? That could be next, next. It won't make a difference, because it will kill us all. <laughs> <laughs> Two thousand one. <laughs> exactly. Oh, you're All saying the it. AI will use the, the quantum AI computing will use the quantum to be especially effective. There, there you go. Okay. Okay. I take it back. I take back the question then. Chuck is right. I hope in our lifetime, but certainly in, in some of our children's lifetime, I think we'll see a lot of progress. Have you ever wanted one of your questions on the universe answered? We all have questions about the universe. From black holes to quasars, quantum entanglement, wormholes. There is no end to the depths of cosmic curiosity. Well, the entry level of Patreon membership with StarTalk gets you just that. I think it starts at $5 a month. You have access to the question line that reaches our Cosmic Query programming. And not only that, we produce a special Cosmic Queries installment just for Patreon members. So if you weren't the director of the Hayden Planetarium, what do you think you would be doing? Okay, what? It, but this had to be another universe. It wouldn't right. happen in this universe. Okay. Uh, I'd be, I'd be a, a, a songwriter for Broadway musicals. Ooh! So that's the entry level and the perks ascend from there. Uh, there's a level, in fact, where we send you a, an autographed copy of one of my latest books uh, right now. It's Starry Messenger, Cosmic Perspectives on Civilization. And it's signed with my fancy fountain pen with purple ink. So uh, I invite you to just check the link below. And all of that money goes to our ability to experiment with new ways of bringing the universe down to Earth. So thank you for those who have already joined. And we welcome others to participate in this grand adventure of what it is to bring the universe down to earth. As always, keep looking up. All right, so, so if you are in the same field, even though you're, it's specifically different, swapping out whole pages of DNA, nonetheless, you are changing, or you would say restoring, but it's still changing the DNA profile you had before you walked into the room. Now in your cases, it's kind of, the morality of it is trivial the kids are gonna die, okay? But there are many genetic disorders, we call them, where you can still live a full life. It's just you don't match up with the model human mm -hmm. who you compare your, all your senses and all your limbs, and are they all to match the model human? Well, then you're normal, all right? And if you don't match it, then you're not normal. Like baldness. 
<laughs> so so where, where does, who says what's normal and what's not? I mean, I think that Before 1987, I read that the American Psychiatric Association had, until then, had classified homosexuality as a brain disorder. And so if it's a disorder judged by some committee of people, then who is deciding who gets gene therapy and who doesn't? Hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I think what's normal is probably defined by the times and by the culture. Should it be? Maybe, maybe not. Okay. Um, but, I, but I can tell you what's not normal is... I know 170 years ago what was considered normal in the United agree, States yeah. in the South, yeah. okay? And 170 years from now, it might be that much different, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but uh, I know what's not normal, right? Which is having these devastating diseases. That, right. I don't think that's Death. normal. Death. Death. Yeah. 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 Death, I guess, is normal, but... Well, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But not at but a young not age. At two years not old. at two years old. That is, we can all agree right. that's not exactly. normal. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, th I think that you're talking about designer gene therapy, and that's obviously somewhat of a controversial topic that's going to evolve over time. Um, but I think we start where we start and then see where it goes. No, because I, I say that, and I didn't come up with this. I mean, I see it ri rising up around me. Uh, what's the film... Um, Gattaca. No, no, I know Gattaca. That, <laughs> That's uh, no, no, it's the film that had, um, it was a, a rock musician who went deaf. Oh, uh, oh Beethoven? Uh, no, 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 rock, rock music. Oh, rock music. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I'm well, kidding. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm kidding. <laughs> he, he was uh, a rock and roll he, he told, artist he of his totally time. Could have rocked he was the, the house. first rocker. Yeah, the first he was rock. one yeah. Yeah. Totally yeah. could have rocked the house. Yeah. It's, a, it's a recent sort of indie film. Anyhow, the, the taken. So, the Sound of Metal. Sound of Metal. Oh, sound of Metal. Okay. In that, it's a rock performer, and he, you know, he plays loud rock music, and then he goes deaf, mm. pretty catastrophically. And then he learns that there's a whole community of deaf people. I'm mm. summarizing here. Mm. And, but then they find a way that they could put devices in and have restore some of the hearing. And then, but he'd gotten so accustomed to the silence and the community of others, mm who embraced that right. state of existence, that, no, he ultimately rejected it. But that's because he had children. Wow. Oh, that's tough. <laughs> <laughs> it's real easy to say, I'm, I'm okay with being deaf <laughs> when, you have, when you have children. You're screaming children. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so again, that's a case where he's otherwise healthy, just one of his senses is gone. And so, uh, so I, 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 I wonder where the future of this goes and what kind of future, um, I, you know, is there a sort of morality committee? Is there a, or in your field? Surely there's something going on in the but, genetics. But that field. would be such a great thing because in order to get where you just said, Neil, we would have to be so advanced. Oh, right. We would have cured all diseases. All the disease, yeah. would ne nobody would point. care about the disease anymore because we would be to a place where we're now worried about why is everybody having white babies? <laughs> <laughs> and just and, and one other example. We, uh, Oliver Sacks was a uh, guest on one of our earliest episodes of oh, Star Talk. Uh, I got to befriend him briefly. We weren't beer drinking buddies, but so he's a neuroscientist best-selling author. The movie Awakenings was based on his research. I uh, had Robin Williams in it, uh, brilliantly acted in that role. Um, I attended a lecture he gave on, I think it was hallucinogenics or something. He's a brain guy. And, but he, he reminded us of his neurological condition. So he has, I forgot the full word, but the, for regular people word, he has face blindness. Okay? okay, where you don't recognize people's faces, even if you know them well. Yeah. And so I would then realize that he would only recognize me after I started speaking. He'd be polite as a new shake hands, and then I'd speak, oh, yes, Neil, how are you? Okay. So I asked him, if we developed a pill, a magic pill, and you could take it back in time, you could take it when you were a kid, to cure you of this, would you? And he said, no, he wouldn't. Mm. Because that very affliction in his mind is what got him interested in neuroscience to begin with. Mm, wow. And so I think to myself, again, if we're going to compare ourselves to some 
like model homes, you have a model human. If you want everything to be, quote, normal, that might eviscerate civilization of the most interesting people our genome can produce. And, and to bring it back to music, I would say some of the most creative geniuses of our time and previous times weren't completely normal. Uh, you know, and, and you know, they, they were challenged, they were troubled. Vincent were, Van Gogh among them? And go Mozart. Not that it's a prerequisite, yeah. but it's not, it doesn't preclude right. that you can be highly creative and productive. Correct. I think that that is an outworking of <clears throat> being challenged in a way. Yes. So, yes. You know, because even if you're normal and you're not challenged, right. then what, what do you have to overcome? Exactly. Right. So, I mean, you can say the same thing about poverty, but does that mean that you don't want to end poverty? I mean, there are many people who will tell you that if it were not for the humble beginnings from which I came, I would not be the person that I am today. Right. And I say to them, that's not necessarily the case. Mm. There could have been some other stimulus that would have sparked in you whatever motivated you to become what you are. Mm. So it's not, it's, it, it's, it's what we know that made us it's what we know. So we say it because that's what we know, yeah. but we don't know what could what have What else could happen? Right. Sure. So is the FDA your friend or your enemy? Ooh. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, turn off the camera. Oh, I was no. going to say. Turn off the camera. <laughs> I was like, I thought this was a friendly discussion. <laughs> um, <laughs> absolutely. Oh, let, me, let me ask it a different way. Uh, is the FDA more stringent about their test than most, if not all, other countries? And is that a good thing? I think they are, and I think that's a good thing. Yeah. Okay. I think, especially as a, a scientist. As a scientist, yeah. The results have to have to work. They, they've got to be statistically right, especially right. given how susceptible we are to thinking something that's true that isn't. Yeah. Or thinking that something isn't true that is. Wow. Yeah. That is that is rampant. Yeah. Okay. So given that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what? How does one get access? I mean, there's a price. You're a publicly traded company, so all your stuff is going to cost money. And I can't afford it, and I have a kid who's dying. So what do I do? So, don't take this pricing. Personally. No, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. So rough question. The, the question. Another way to think about the question is, what is the cost of not giving a life-saving therapy, and what is the cost to that individual, that family, and to society? And regulators and payers can come up with a price that makes sense, that's based on the magnitude of clinical benefit. Those are discussions insurance that companies, insurance companies, and payers, well. exactly, right? So okay. insurance companies would ultimately agree to be payers for that therapy because of the data they see. And that's discussions that we're starting to have now. And to answer the FDA question, they're absolutely friends. Um, when we go to FDA meetings, sometimes you can't figure out who's from the company and who's from the FDA. They're helping us, we're helping them. That's it's a good become, it, yes. it's, it's, uh, They're not some on, on the other side of some wall. Yes. They're a participant uh, in finding the solution. And they're people also, they have children. And, um, and I think once you understand that this is, we're learning together, it opens up the, the doors. And, you know, again, going back to curiosity and wonder, I think we go into the room with a sense of wanting to learn and the outcome has always been great. So as a, I, this is only a question I can ask of a CEO. Um, how do you measure your risk factors? Yeah. Because in, in, in space launches, uh, you know, Elon Musk has been very public about his launches where they blow up on the launch pad, right? And I spent a fair amount of time working with NASA. I was on their board for a while. And there was always someone in the room who was afraid that if the public saw a rocket blow up or some major mistake, that somehow they'll withdraw the funding. And my reply to that was, as an educator, you need to teach people that the day you stop making mistakes is the evidence you're not on the frontier. And so the public needs to be sensitized to what risk means here. Yeah. Risk doesn't mean never anything going wrong. Risk means sometimes stuff goes wrong, and then provided you learn from that, that's all a good thing. So how do right. you, yeah. in terms of R&D, because you don't even have product yet, you said, right? Okay. So our, there's R&D versus profit versus all of this, and, and how risk averse are you? Yeah, we, we need, I think the, the secret sauce here is the right people, world-class people who are gonna be, uh, believe and stay and 
uh, persevere with grit and tenacity over time. Way to suck up to your employees. Yeah. <laughs> they inspire me more than I inspire them. Um, you, you need Chuck, patient. we are their guests oh, here, that's, okay? That's <laughs> I'll behave, I'll behave. <laughs> we, we need patient investors who believe in the story. And yes, mistakes are a part of this. And since we're talking about these fields all mixing together, in the world of music, I've had the chance to sit and learn from uh, real, really great masters uh, as a musician. And the What's best masters. I sing uh, Indian classical music and I play this instrument called the harmonium. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, but the greatest masters are the least judgmental. That's what I've learned. Mm -hmm. And even when you play a wrong note, they'll consider it musical because they hear what no one else hears. And I think that's the same with making mistakes in science. There's no right or wrong. You have to make mistakes. And I actually applaud SpaceX's um, you know, being open about it and not fear fearful about it. Yes, right. I, I, I do too, because I am not buying a ticket. <laughs> I told Elon, I said, Elon, I'll ride one of your rockets after you fly your mother on one of them <laughs> there back you go. safely. <laughs> then, I'll, then, I'll, then I'll go. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Gorov Shah, the co-founder and CEO of Rocket Pharma, giving us a glimpse into the future of gene therapy. This has been Star Talk, and I've been your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson. As always, keep looking up.